Hi everyone and welcome to the video 16 in the video series, An Introduction to Land Administration. I'm Dr. Rosalie Kingwall and in this video I'm joined by Dr. Simon Howell and Chepa Fokani as we discuss the tools for doing land administration. As I mentioned in the previous lesson on the fit for purpose approach to land administration, new approaches are required to secure the wide range of land tenure types that exist, particularly in developing countries. New approaches require new tools. Wait, wait, hang on, Simon. What is a tool in this context? And how does it differ from policy, law, principle, and approach? Jepo, a, a tool is something that enables us to perform a predetermined objective or task. So in this context, it's no different from an ordinary task, like hanging a picture on a wall. We first look at the objective of the task, in this case, hanging a picture, uh, followed by detailing the task. So where exactly on the wall must it be hung? How heavy is it and what sort of hook is required to keep it up there? Uh, once we know the answers to those questions, we either select or make the right tools to enable us to carry out what we want to do. In this case, we would need a ladder, a hammer, some nails, maybe a tape measure, maybe a spirit level. And the same applies to land administration. Having the right tool for the job is essential for getting the job done efficiently and effectively. Oh, okay. Well, that, that helps us to understand the idea of tools. The Global Land Tool Network, um, which we know is the GLTN, and the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, known as the FAO, and the World Bank and many other international and local organizations and NGOs have developed several land tools to assist in recognizing and securing the full range of land tenure types across the continuum. The need for these tools has arisen due to the declining supply of and the rising demand for land, which is a consequence of the climate change and population growth, as well as changes in the economy. Okay. So I remember we referred to this as a driver for land administration in video three. This situation has led to increased competition for land and land administration institutions are unable to cope with pressure due to their own capacity issues and possibly inappropriate approaches used. Correct, Chepo. Um, and this in turn results in the exclusion of the majority of land rights holders from administration by the National Land Administration System, which results in social exclusion, tenure insecurity, environmental degradation, vulnerability, conflict and corruption. All these deficiencies contribute to poverty. Land tools that are appropriate can help to support land administration institutions in the face of these challenges. So according to a UN Habitat publication, a land tool is a way to put principles, policies and legislation into effect. The term covers a wide range of methods from a simple checklist to use when conducting a survey, a set of software and accompanying protocols, or a broad set of guidelines and approaches. So just to check, Land tools come in a variety of forms, for example, as a checklist, as software or hardware, or as guiding principles. Yes, that's right. There's no short answer to the question of what tools could be used to support land administration. To give you an example, uh, the, these are some examples of land tools, uh, some of which we've even discussed. The land tenure security models designed by Prof. Jenny Whittle and Dr. Maurice Mbizi that we discussed in video 11. There's the fit for purpose approach to land administration I presented in video 14. There's the land administration domain model and the social tenure domain model, the land governance assessment framework, the voluntary guidelines on responsible governance of tenure, uh, enumeration of sites using handheld global navigation satellite systems or GNSS, which most people uh, call GPS, that's only one of them. Uh, that can be used in informal settlements. Uh, digital recording of sites using aerial photography or drones. Smartphones and apps such as mobile applications to support tenure developed by USAID. 
technologies such as geographic information systems or, or GIS, uh, drones, laser scanners, aerial and satellite images. Don't forget the Rural Land Use Plans, or PFR, Plan Foncier Rural, which were developed in West Africa, one of the first examples of an adapted type of approach. Land tours can take many forms, but the GRTN has grouped them into five broad categories. Tools that support access to land and tenure security, that's one. Two, Tools that support land management and planning. Three, tools that support land administration and land information systems. Four, tools that support land-based financing. And five, tools that support land policy and legislation. Of the examples that we've mentioned, we'll elaborate briefly here on the social tenure domain model or STDM because it provides a counterpoint to the formal route of land survey and registration for securing title. The STDM's focus is on the provision of tenure security through modeling the complex tenure relationships that are found in informal settlements and customary tenure situations. Okay. By modeling, we mean that the STDM can be used to describe the links between parties, social tenures, and spatial units. Similar to the model of a cadastral system presented in video 13, which focuses on the tenure relationship between land, people, and rights. The STDM models the relationship between the parties, social tenure, and spatial units. When we say parties, it may be an individual, groups, companies, a municipality, a married couple, or any other grouping of people and individuals who would hold rights and land. Social tenure is now the relationship between parties and spatial units and may be informal land rights, long leases, rental, ownership, use rights, areas of conflict or disagreements, and even the overlapping land rights. And when we talk of the spatial units, we actually mean these are the discrete areas of land, natural resources, properties, structures or objects, usually demarcated by general boundaries. The STDM makes use of a variety of fit-for-purpose supporting documents such as photographs, uh, aerial images and photos of land rights holders, uh, videos, sketches, maps, audio recordings and other such evidence. So it's in line with the fit-for-purpose land administration approach that we discussed earlier. It's available as a free plugin for QGIS, which is an open source, free access geographic information systems platform from which certificates of occupation and use rights can be issued. These can provide evidence of individual, family or group rights to certain parts of land that, if recognized by the community and authority concerned, will improve the holder's tenure security. Yes, this is a very important distinction, Simon. The tool provides the means for recognition of tenure security, but it's still up to the local authority, that is the community or government authority concerned, to recognize and respect the land rights that are being claimed. That's right. A hammer can't do anything on its own. It needs to be wielded by someone and used appropriately to get that nail into the wall to hang the picture up. So... Is the ultimate goal for the evidence captured in the STDM to be recognized and respected by the relevant authorities and eventually to be incorporated into an integrated national land administration system? Yes, Jepo. Through recognition of land rights and provision of security using tools such as the STDM, otherwise overlooked individuals, families, and communities can be raised one step out of poverty. But the goal isn't necessarily for individual or even community title to land. In keeping with Jenny Whittle's tenure security model and the fit for purpose approach to land administration, certificates issued by communities using the SCDM or something similar may well prove to be sufficient 
for the purpose of securing tenure and reaping the benefits thereof. Such benefits could be improved social standing, peace of mind, access to credit, reduced conflict about land, opening up the land market, certainty and legitimacy. Wow. But of course, it's not all roses. Critics of STDM point out that it's, it's very complex to use and implement in situations where there's no state land administration authority to plug into. For example, in a recent informal settlement upgrading project in Cape Town, which was supported by an NGO, the land record system that was developed avoided the STDM as being too prescriptive and too complex, particularly as they wanted the community members to be able to run it. They found it more useful to develop a community record system, which they call the CRS, um, in conjunction with the community, focusing on community needs. An important tool to assist with this was the use of open source GIS software and aerial imagery in identifying dwellings and to create a management system for the community. Existing facilities such as communal toilets and taps were physically surveyed using handheld GNSS. A participatory community-driven evolutionary approach involving multiple stakeholders including the city of Cape Town, was essential for the success of this project. Wow, Rosie, now that is some food for thought. So in summary then, the three important points for tools of, for land administration are, A, tools follow objectives. So first, we must define our objective, and then if there is no tool in the current toolkit, we must make new tools or adapt the old ones. B, tools must be appropriate and useful for the particular context it is designed for. And C, we should not despair if the state's tools are not appropriate. In fact, we should design, pilot, and use new ones to demonstrate that it is possible to meet the needs of those who are currently excluded from the system and that is exactly what international and now local NGOs are doing. And that wraps up video 16. And I hope you'll join us in our final video where we give you some reflections on our learnings throughout this process. <music>